Thank you, John. And welcome, everybody. Um, sorry, I was to give this in September, but we had a family emergency, and it's taken me a, a while to dig out for my... Uh, anyway, the title talk is, uh, what is an ABI and why is it breaking, breaking it bad? There's been a bunch of talk on various reflectors and groups about ABI, ABI breaks and on standard committee mailing lists and so on like that. Um, so I thought I'd give some content and some opinion and so on. Uh, you have a button down at the bottom of the Zoom um, window for asking questions. Um, as during the talk, I probably won't respond to them as we go on, but I'll hang on and answer them at the end. Uh, anyway, about me, because it's always about me, uh, my name is Marshall Clow. Uh, until last February, I was the chairman of the Library Working Group on the Plus Plus Standards Committee. Uh, I've been maintaining LibC++ for a long time. Um, I'm doing less of that now, and um, I'm cutting back workload um, because we've, like I said, we've had a lot of family problems. Anyway, so let's just jump right into this. Uh, this talk, what is an ABI? Why would breaking it be bad? And why are my slides not? Okay, what is an ABI break? Well, I'll get to that. I've got a lot of slides before I get to what is an ABI break, but ABI stands for Application Binary Interface. And it is uh, has to do with um, things like parameter passing and layouts layout of structures and having uh, how exceptions are handled and so on. And this is this is not strictly a concern of the standard library of the, the C++ standard. This is a concern for the platform vendors. Um, now you you don't expect to be able to tell something for ARM and run it on x86 or vice versa to say something, or you know, on a risk five machine or something like uh, are not only are the instruction sets not compatible, but the layout of structs may not be, the size of integers may not be the same and so on. So that's not really what I'm going to talk about today about cross-platform ABI, you know, uh, about interoperability concerns, but all on a single platform. But um I wanted to make the point that the ABI, the application binary interface, is really defined by the platform, not by the C++ standard. Okay, anyway, um, in C++ and in C, actually, there's this, this idea of the one definition rule. Um, there's a really nice write-up of it on C++ CPP reference. You can search for one definition rule on C++ reference, it'll take you right to the page excuse me, <clears throat> right to the page there. And basically, you know, it, there's a lot of words there. But basically what it comes down to is, says if there's more than one non-identical definition of an entity in a program, then the behavior of that program is undefined. Now, I've given a bunch of talks about undefined behavior. I've given a talks about just straight up undefined behavior, about tools to help you find undefined behavior like address sanitizer, or UBSAN, and you could kind of think of this as another uh, another in that series of talks, but mostly this is about a very specific thing that has recently become a top of interest on the standards committee. So an ABI break is basically a very specific ODR violation, and it's an artifact of separate compilation, separate linkings of shared libraries usually, but not always. Um, if we had no shared compilation, there would be no ABI breaks. Okay. All right. So let's look at some ODR files. Um, here's some examples. And wow, I've lost the title to the slide. Um, you can have two different definitions of something. You can um, you can change the layout of a struct. You can do a bunch of things to it. And I actually have examples. So we'll move right on past this slide, which doesn't have a title. Okay, so let's start with this one. Here we have a struct, struct foo. It has two members, right? It has 
an int 32 ta and an int 32 tb I, i'm using in these examples i'm using int 2 t as opposed to int or long or whatever because i really don't want to get into um discussions of well on this platform an int is 32 bits on this platform is in 64 bits and on and so on and so forth that's that's not a, the point of the these examples. Well, here we have a struct. It has two fields, A and B. It's a very simple. But in this other header file, we have another definition for foo, and it's different. It has three fields. The first two are the same, but the third one is different. And so, you just, we flip back and forth here, and you see that that's the only difference. Okay. But the question is, what happens if you mix two chunks of code which has seen foo, the first definition of foo, and one of which has seen the second definition of foo? So the first definition will believe that the, a foo is eight bytes long. And the second definition will, include, will believe that foo is 12 bytes long. And if so, if you mix these, if you pass foos around in some way, foos pointer to foos, arrays of foos, um, this could cause problems. Your code will behave. If you're, you know, if you're lucky, um, your code will crash quickly, reliably. If you're not lucky, you'll get wrong answers. If you're really unlucky, you'll get reasonable looking wrong answers or occasionally right answers. To my mind, that's the worst. Yes, this is just undefined behavior, okay? But the point is, is that, you know, this is the kind of thing that can happen to people. Um, just aside there, if you have classes that inherit from foo or contain memory rules of type foo, um, they are affected as well. And you have to, you know, which, which version definition of foo they see affects how they act. Um, things that inherit from foo, this actually has a long history in C++. It's called problem. And basically what that means, or fragile base class, is if you have a base class, if you have a class that other things inherit from, uh, and you, uh, in, you change anything in base class, like adding a member variable is the most common one. Adding, uh, you can do other things. Uh, you need to recompile all of your derived classes transitively, all your derived classes, all your derived from derived classes, and so on. Because otherwise, you will you will have run afoul of the one definition rule, and your um, your program will exhibit undefined behavior. Okay. So there's 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 the, the canonical example. You added a added a field, but there are other ways to break this. Okay, you have variation on a theme. You can remove a member. Obviously, that works the exact same way. You know, two different pieces of code that have ideas, different ideas about the size of a class. Um, you can reorder members if you switch B and A and A and B. Now they're the same size but still different pieces of code that sees the different definitions will have different ideas on how to deal with it. When you want to say stop all the A's in, in an array of these, if you see the second definition where the, order, the members have been reordered, you might end up with a sum of B's instead of A's. Because um, C++ does by the time it gets the object file, it doesn't actually know what the field names are. All it knows is offsets. It knows that an offset four is a, there's an int 32, which is, which is refers to B or maybe A, depending on what, which um, definition you see. Um, another one is called pragma pack. Every compiler has something like pragma pack. It basically affects how structures are packed together. You know how how things are aligned in there, whether or not things are squished together, reducing padding, and so on. It's really useful for say matching wire formats or things like that. But if you have you know two definitions of a structure, even if they're the same, but one of them is inside a say pack one, 
and the other one is inside, not inside it, they may have doubts. They may have, you know, um, and so bad things will happen. Okay, let's look at a different example of how you can change a, uh, a class or a struct and have it, um, have it be different. Here we have a um, struct foo, no members this time, just two virtual functions, function one and a destructor. And in some other header file, you have a one, a two, and, and a destructor. Now, that's the only difference. The difference is somebody added the, um, the virtual function two. Okay, so what happens? How is this implemented under the hood? Under the hood, every variable of type foo has a vtable pointer. It's a, a pointer to a virtual table, which is an array of function pointers. There's one function point, one per virtual function. So the first definition, if you're generating code based on definition, you believe that function table contains two entries. And if you're doing the second one, you believe that function table has function pointer hat table of function pointers, excuse me, three entries. Needless to say, this could cause confusion. Um, there's a question for you. How are entries ordered in the virtual table in the V table? The answer is that's defined by the compiler. There, there is no agreed on order. They could be the order in which they're declared in the, in the struct. They could be alphabetized. They could be, you know, short to long mangoes. It doesn't really matter. It's that they are, in fact, consistent. That different runs of the compiler put things in the V table at, um, at in the same order. Um, what happens if you were to call... The destructor say in the um, from code that believed you had one definition when in fact you had another. It's going to get the virtual table pointer out of the object. That's fine. It's going to go pick an entry out of the um, out of the table. Which one? I don't know. And it's going to it's going to call that. Now, if it thinks it's going to get the third entry in the V table and there's only two, it's going to pick up a random address and try to call that. If it thinks that there are, um, if it thinks that the, the destruct is at offset one and instead it's at offset two, it's going to call the wrong member function. Anyway, bad things are going to happen here. Um, during the run-up to C++20, one of the proposals that was not adopted for C++20 was to add a, another floating point type. This would be called half float or short float. I don't remember which, but it's a 16-bit floating point type. Um, people like to do 16-bit floating point arithmetic these days, and, and a lot of processors have, you know, have SSE instructions that work on eight. 16 point bit floats all at once. Uh, anyway, the problem, one of the problems with this proposal was that adding support in IO streams for this, these new, this new type, excuse me, not these, these, this new type would involve adding a new virtual function to a couple of classes in IO streams, specifically to numput and numget, which is the, the classes inside of other streams that have numeric input and output. This would be a bad, this would definitely be a, uh, a change in, in the, uh, the virtual function B table layout. This could lead to bad things just like I showed above. Anyway, um, okay, this, ne this next one is much more subtle. Um, so I saw a, a question from Zach who said, does this imply that separate runs of the compiler may generate different vtable orders? 
Uh, no, no, that that's kind of a requirement for the compiler if it's a separate compilation that it generate consistent V table order. Um, otherwise, yeah, you can't, you couldn't do separate compilation and link things together. Um, the point, my point is that it has to be consistent, but it doesn't actually um, have to be documented. Or actually, let me rephrase that. It doesn't have to be consistent across compilers. It has to be consistent within a compiler. Um, as it turns out, that Clang, for example, when when Clang was being developed, one of their design criteria, one, one of their goals was to generate um, object files which were compatible with GCC. And so they went and looked and see how how did GCC order um, virtual functions in the V table and match that. I honestly don't know what the order is. I suspect it's the order in which they're declared in the class. I don't know that. Um, so now all that you require from the compiler for those things is that they be consistent across runs of the compiler. Because otherwise, yeah, separate compilation would not work. And we know separate compilation works. Um, okay, anyway, this one's a little more subtle. So imagine you have a struct named pair. I don't know why you would have a struct named pair, but we have a struct named pair. Okay, it has it's a struct, it has two functions, and it has a copy constructor. It takes a pair. And the copy constructor constructs the first member, copy the second member, that's all it does. And you say, wait, wait, but we have tools now. And just make that cool default. Uh, yes, yes, we can. Okay. Um, and that's not a bad thing. Except it's a behavior change. And let me explain. Okay. Um, see, the only difference is, right. So what have we done? We've let the compiler generate the copy constructor for pair by saying equal default. Since it's a struct, the default copy constructor does member-wise construction, exactly what we were doing before. It should even generate the same code. Same code. Okay, but there's a behavior change here. And the behavior change is, is that with this change, specialization or some specializations of pair can be trivially copyable, trivially copy constructible, trivially copy assignable, well, constructible because we changed the constructor. Um, where before they could never be. And the reason they could never be is because pair had a user-defined copy constructor. And if you say equal default, it now does not have a user-defined copy constructor. And that's one of the, re the requirements for being trivially copyable is that it, it does not have a user-defined copy constructor. Okay, what does this mean? Okay, what does this mean? This mean, but why does this matter? Actually, it's a better say. On some platforms, parameters of trivially copyable types, which can fit into a register, are passed as function parameters in a register rather than on the stack. So, say pair stead pair of short comma int or short comma care say. That will almost certainly fit into a register. And um, if you think of this pair as being STD pair, then, and this change was made, then STD pair short comma care can, would now be passed as a register in a register rather than on the stack. Not all specializations of pair would be trivially copyable. It depends on what type T. T1 and T2 are, if they are in fact trivially constructible, trivially copy constructible. But some are. Okay, this, this change was actually proposed for C14, I think. Might have been 17, but 14 or 17. And it was not adopted specifically because of this problem, this, this change in behavior. It's the interesting thing is. It, the change with the change, the 
the code generated for pairs copy constructor would be exactly the same. But you've changed, with this change, you've changed how some specializations of pair would be passed as parameters. Okay, that one's a pretty subtle one. All right, let's talk about this. How do I get from an ODR violation to an ABI break? Right, because this was a, this is a talk about ABI breaks, and we've just I've been talking about ODR violations. Okay, um, the easiest way to do that is to think about two versions instead of two header files with different definitions, take two different versions of the same header file and a shared library that goes with. So you install a new version of library that you use and it comes with an updated header file. And there's a different declaration for a struct that you use in your code. And your code does not get rebuilt to incorporate that change. Maybe you don't have the source for that. Um, maybe you decide that you're going up the uh, because, because you're using ICU, the International Components for Unicode, and you see there's a new release and it has some features you like, so you install a, uh, you update the version of ICU on your system. But you have this other app that uses ICU and uses the C++ bindings in ICU, and maybe that app is called, oh, I don't know, Microsoft Word. Well, you should recompile that, right? Because that because it might pick up there might be changes in the header files for ICU. Well, you don't, obviously you don't have the source for Microsoft Word, or maybe you do. I don't know. John used to work at Microsoft. Maybe he has the source for Word. Um, anyway, but the point is, is updating uh, ICU because you want new features if. Things have changed in the definitions of the, of the types that ICU provides. Then this this is an ABI break. That's what an ABI break is. You have, get a new version of something, and it, the application binary interface of that something has changed. If it's changed, then you need to build all the things that use it. Um, another way to get a new thing is to you install a system update. Your OS vendor provides you a system update and it installs an updated shared library of something. Well, I don't know, MySQL or STD C++ or even libc++. Um, and something's changed. You know, imagine you install a separate, a, a, new, a new version of your standard library and it has this change in it. And suddenly your existing binary crash every now and then where they didn't before. And this was the only change because now under certain circumstances, these pairs are expecting to be, are, are being passed. Register, but your code that you haven't recompiled expects to see them on the stack. This is an ABI break. Okay. This is, and Ugly and nasty and really, really hard to detect. Um, anyway, now, adding a field structure, okay, yeah, you, you can kind of think to yourself, right, the size has changed. This is a, you know, code that expected to be eight and now it's 12. This is a problem. Adding a virtual function is a little more subtle. Um, but, you know, once you've seen that once, you, you can be on the lookout. This one, this one was is quite subtle, and it requires you know knowledge about the um, the calling convention for the platform you're working on. And Lucas has popped something into the chat about the Itanium C++ ABI doc, which is a great, one. but it also talking about how the order of virtual function pointers in the virtual table is the order of additions in the class. Fine. Um, that's a perfectly reasonable way to order them. I'm sure that the, the GCC people are really, really happy to know that I think they're reasonable. I think they don't care. But yeah. Um, so 
this is uh, this is one of those things that you know that pair change would have been really bad if we had been adopted that and and people had shipped it. It's a very strange, and the idea is, yeah, yeah, this is this is you know, this is a better way to specify. It just says you know, as pairwise construction, you know, as memberwise construction, which is what this does. But there's a side of there, or there's a there's a there's an additional bit there. Is a better way to say. It. Okay, so the question is, how can you avoid doing this? Because this, right? Um, the answer is, don't change things that affect ABI. When I was uh, much younger, there was this there was this raft of jokes that were generally called doctor doctor jokes. Um, and, and the basically canonical joke was, doctor, doctor, it hurts when I do this. Doctor says, well, don't do it. Um, yeah, Doc, doctor, hurts when I hit my hand hammer. Well, don't hit your hand with a hammer. Um, doctor, doctor, my, my programs crash when I change the IBI on my shared library and don't recompile. Well, don't do that. Um, don't have stale binaries. Don't have binaries that are older than the things they use. Um, have only one definition for everything. But um, the, that is that there are lots of things that you don't have source for. I mean, there are people out there, there are organisms out there that don't have any stale binaries because every single time they build a system, they rebuild everything from source. Um, they rebuild all their shared libraries, including standard library they use. They, you know, they rebuild everything every single time. And if you can do that, you won't have any ABI breaks because every single has its own ABI. But this only works if A, you have source for every single thing you use, and B, you're willing to spend a lot of use cycles rebuilding everything all the time. People can do that. People do that. All right. Um, like I said, avoid stale binaries. Stale binaries include commercial core. Um, and have one definition includes all the libraries you use transitively. If you use, you know, MySQL, which uses some networking library, which uses the standard library. Well, those are all libraries that you have to worry about. You know, if I update that networking library, is that going to cause my my library to break, which is going to cause my programs to break? Yeah. You have to be aware of this. Um, really, the easiest thing is don't change a, things that affect ABI. That's that's hard. It's easy to inadvertently change ABI. Okay. Do we have examples of an ABI break in the wild? Oh yes, very much so. We have the canonical one. For C11, the, the C standard committee tightened up the, the definitions of what STD string, basic string, could do and could not do. And it effectively outlawed copy on write string. Copy on strings are, um, well, they don't play well in a multi threaded environment, shall we say. Um, that STD C had to change their implementation. They had change the layout of the, the basic string struct. They had to change the, implement the um, implementation. They had, and basically, you know, it, the st string had an API now. I see somebody in the chat says, yeah, I'm still using the old ABI. Yes. Um, provided a backdoor a thing you could define at compile time and at runtime so that people could keep the layout and behavior for compatibility with old software. Um, many, many people, hi, Daniel, have just refused to change. And organizations just say, no, nope, you know, we're going to stick with the old stuff because you know, we have all of these old binary. Um, I know of at least one large organization who stopped defining 
that thing, G lib C to U C plus plus 11 ABI equals zero. Stop defining that just this last year. Okay, so 10 years after the new, after C++11, nine years after C++11 came out, they, uh, that organization decided to move to C++11 style strings. Um, there are a bunch of people who I think will never change and, unless, uh, you know, libstd C++ moves old format, which I can't see them doing because it doesn't actually ever, it's, it's not really ever changing. Um, every now and then you um, you see it on Stack Overflow. Somebody says, I just installed the, the most recent one was, I have a CentOS system, blah, 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 and I installed GCC 9 on it. And I built some programs, and every now and then crash. And I don't think I'm doing anything wrong here. And here's the source, and up, and up, and up, and up, and up. And, it, and it, yeah, this is what it is, is that the the CentOS they have was built with GCC 4.2 or 4.3, which uh, uses the old string layout and their new shiny GCC 9, use the new string layout, get an ABI mismatch across between the, co the code that they just compiled and the shared library they're using and bad things happen. Um, the last time I saw this on Stack Overflow was May 20, so nine months ago. This is a decade after this thing happened. Um, this is still causing pain, okay, for people. This is years after, and it's still causing pain, and people are adopting um, this. Yeah, most people have, have moved on by now. They've recompiled all their bodies so that they can use the C++11 style strings, but there's a significant person, um, portion of the world out there that just hasn't moved on from C++03. Um, amusing enough, libc++ also has two different string ABIs. Um, after, after we shipped libc++, the initial versions of libc++, um, some people at Google did some profiling and discovered that if you change the layout, uh, but not the size of basic string, um, you get much better cache performance. You get much better cache alignment. And this um, actually was a surprisingly large performance win in real world, a real world code like, you know, browser rendering and things like that. And so we have two different string ABIs. Now, we don't really offer them. We offer them to platform vendors and, and platform vendors decide which one to use. Um, when Apple, like four years, I think it was five years ago, when Apple introduced first 64 iPhone, they chose to use the new, new string ABI on ARM 64. Um, and they did that from the very beginning of using that platform. So there was no AI break there. There's no ABI compatibility because there was no code before that. So this was not an ABI break. It was merely on this platform, the string looks like this. But on x86 or um, ARM32, whatever, whatever we non 64 bit ARM, we still have the old um, standard string layout. So there was not a compatibility problem there. Anyway, this has been, this was a big deal. This was, this was a lot of pain for a lot of people and has not actually, you know, should be a cautionary tale to people who want to change ABIs. Anyway, so why is it, why is G21 talking about this? Well, theoretically, you know, WG21 doesn't really have any reason to poke at this. Uh, there's no I, there's no real concept of in the standards world of compatibility between standards. There's only one standard at any given time. And once the once you have a new standard, the old standard's gone effectively. Um, from the from the, the ISO's point of view. 
The only mention of older standards is the standard is in Annex C, and that's merely informative. Um, in committee speak, informative, is, this is for your information. This is not a requirement. Um, traditionally, it's been implementers who prevented ABI breaks, mostly by speaking up in committee when a change should cause an ABI break, or reporting defects for ABI breaks that were found after a change is under the standard. Um, implementers have a lot of skin in the game because they're interested in preventing user pain. They're the ones who get the bug reports. They're the ones who have to solve these problems. There are some members of WG21 who really want to make changes that involve ABI, you know, all of ABI changes start with having, having a meta discussion when ABI breaks are allowed or desired. There's a paper written POT2028, uh, what is ABI and what should WG21 do about it, which lays out some of the rationale for this. There are a couple of places in the standard library where um, basically changes, it would be changes without breaking ABI, where there is a fair amount of performance that can be. Um, regex, for example, we know a lot more about writing regex engines and so on than we did back in 2006. Um, Hannah has given quite the exemplar over the last few years about how much better regexes could be with her compile time regulation um, talks. And, um, whoops, sorry, somewhere in our house in alarm. Anyway, um, anyway, so, uh, and all the one is in. Um, in unordered containers. Um, the, the people at Google have been doing a lot of work in their Absale library about on making alternate, um, making alternate implementations of unordered containers, whether they be just uh, different organizations or possibly even split store of the, um, the keys kept in one container and the values kept in another container, and um, they're showing some very important um, uh, performance marks. Um, the changes they want, you know, involve ABI just to the existing standard containers, and so we're talking about that. Um, those are big ones. There's, and then there's a list of small things that would be nice to have. Okay. Um, anyway, so how could this be detectable? I mean, one of the really nasty things about ABI breaks is that frequently they're not detectable except that your code crashes. One of the, and, and nobody wants that. One of the suggestions that someone has made is that to, to basically if to choose to have an ABI break, say that for C26, let's just say, let's no, this this hasn't been decided. It hasn't it it has been discussed at some future point. You know, there might be a, an ABI incompatible version of the standard library. When I say say for C26, that is not meaning. Oh yes, this is going to. Please don't go on Reddit. It says Marshall says that the standard library is going to. Going to be, have a different ABI for C plus plus twenty six because that is not the case. Um, one of the suggestions for those, if if such a thing were to happen, is that to, to have implementers change the enabling scheme starting in that release. Basically, you know, there the name Langley has an int introductory introductory character. Blah, can't say that hard. It's hard. Can't say that quickly. Um, starts with most. It starts with Z. And you could change the introductory character to say Y or something. And basically what this would mean is that object files built with that standard would not link with object files built with previous standard. And if you tried to, to load a library that was built with new standard, with code of the old standard, it would fail to load because all the name lookups would fail. OK? Um, it's also possible if we were to do something like this to provide um, 
quote unquote fat binaries, a, an object file or a shared library that contain two different copies of the code, one mangled one way and one mangled the other. Um, so, um, that could be done. I mean, details matter. There's a lot of detail hashed out, but you know, Apple, for example, has had a long history of shipping what they call fat binary. There's, they've recently revived that for their new ARM laptops. You know, the idea is that you can ship ARM code and x86 code in the same executable. Um, back in the day, they did that for 68K and PowerPC code as well. Um, anyway, so this is one of the ways to, that you could um, do this. Um, but the real problem with this kind of, even, even this kind of approach, but with ABI, um, ABI breaks in general is even when they're detectable, the problem is, is that the system the system that you want to check against is never really assembled until you actually launch the program. And that's the time when the executable program, all the shared libraries, the plugins, they're, they're all together. And that's the, uh, and that is where such checking would need to happen. Um, I want to point out that programs manually load plugins that you know, have a plugin directory that you can stuff in and at launch, they enumerate it and choose whether or not to load them, like say browsers or Acrobat or Apache or things like that, um, are not really statically checkable because it depends on configuration information and what um, what browser, what plugins are, are here and which are enabled, enables, you know, a static checker would have to know how to read their, um, their configuration information and so on. Uh, uh, has asked a question, said, the system is never really put together until you actually launch. Isn't this what's happened during linking? Yes, I'm going to ask that, answer that one right now. Um, but basically, the thing is, is that during linking, you specify all the things that are needed to run the program. And then that, that's, um, you say, I, I'm going to gather up all these object files and I'm going to require these shared libraries. Let's, let's just say there's one shared library, lib, lib C++, because you know, that's the one I worked on. Okay, and then you take that executable that you just linked and take it to another machine and launch it. And it says, I need libc++, libc++.dilib. And that other machine says, I have a libc++.dilib, here it is. Is that the same version of the dilib that you, that you linked against? Maybe. Maybe not. Um, to give an example, say you're on Mac OS and not 14, and then you and you build yourself a program, and then you upgrade your system to 10.15, and you launch that program again. That's a different shared library, a different dialib. So, no, it doesn't all happen during linking. I mean, a lot of it happens during linking. Okay, hopefully that answers Emma's question. If it doesn't, um, she can ask some more. That'd be fine. I would be fine with that. Okay. So, let's, oops, let me get back to my slides. Okay, so what would this mean to developers? Okay. Um, so if you assume, actually, you know what? Let me answer Chris, Chris's question because it's, it's like a follow on. No, no, I'm going to wait on Chris's question. Never mind. Um, anyway, assume kind of fat binary packaging scheme. 
developers could ship binaries could would have to choose between choosing, you know, supporting old standards, new standards, both. Um, if you have a packaging scheme, um, then you know most of this is you know make file whacking. You know, build everything twice and package it all together. But it's probably a little more complicated than that. There's certainly a testing burden, certainly a a distribution burden. You know, your binaries get as big. Uh, I know, for example, that the the standard library team at Microsoft is uh, it gets uh, is under pressure to reduce the size of their uh, their their binary, not double it, because the that basically people want a minimal Windows install to be actually noticeably smaller. Anyway, so it's not a lot of pain for developers. I mean, there are real costs, but in terms of for people who are developing uh, software, it's not such an awful thing. But what about users? So if you have Assuming that there's an, you know, an ABI break coming and assuming that you know, there's some kind of, you have some way of detecting the ABI break, whether it be the changing the name mangling or whatever. If you have source every bit of software that you use and you're willing to rebuild it, this is not a problem for you. And there are, there are people out there in the world, there are organizations out there in the world that, that absolutely have this. Um, if you're an OS vendor, say, you know, the Ubuntu folk, for example, definitely fall into this category. Um, if you never use any third-party software, then this is not a problem with you for you because your OS vendor will take care of all this. Um, if um, because you're getting all your software from one place, and it's all it all comes from the same place at the same time, so there won't be any ABI concern. But if you have binaries that use C++ internally somehow, then this could affect you. Okay, so let's do this. Let's take a look at these questions. Actually, let's, let's work through this poll. Okay, imagine you're a graphic artist and you're a heavy photo user and you get a system update from somewhere, Apple, Microsoft, Ubuntu, whatever, um, and you upgrade and it comes with a new standard line dilib which has a different ABI and you say dang but fortunately Adobe is right on top of this Adobe has stuff ready to go on day zero and they have a new new copy of Photoshop and which uses that new ABI and you launch a new version of Photoshop and mm, none of your third party plugins flow for those who are not familiar with the Photoshop uh, software economy or ESM, there is a there is a thriving market in third-party plugins that add additional effects functionality to Photoshop. Photoshop has a well-documented uh, plugin mechanism. None of your third-party plugins load because they're all using the old ABI. Maybe they crash. That would be worse. Maybe they crash on launch. Maybe they corrupt your document. Blah. Or you crash when they use, but not loading is the best possible outcome. Okay. You're a heavy, you're a heavy Photoshop user, i.e., you use Photoshop to make money. Um, you know, this is how you make your living. Now you have to disable all those plugins that you use on a regular basis and contact the say 15 different developers the 40 plugins you use on a regular basis. Some of them will say, oh, sure, here's a new version. Some of them will say, oh, yeah, I have a new version, but it's going to cost you don't know how much. Some will, oh, yeah, you have to get version three, which is, you know, 50 bucks. I don't know what. Some will say, oh, thanks for letting me know. I'll get right on that. Some of them will say, yeah, it's on my list. And some of them will not answer your emails or phone because they're busy or they're back in school, or this is a part-time gig for them, or whatever. So what do you do to get your system back up and running? You go to your backup, you restore the old working system, and you move on, and you say, yeah, I am not ready to upgrade. Maybe I'll never be ready to upgrade. 
Um, this is not a, a really great scenario for people who want to uh, move things forward. Compatibility is kind of a bear. Okay, let's go to questions. Go to questions. We have a few questions. Let's take a look. All right, Tyler says, I will be, read that Apple says Swift will be ABI compatible going forward. Um, what strategies will they have to employ to innovate in the language without not, with, while not breaking the ABI? Um, I certainly can't speak for Apple. I have not worked at Apple in, wow, almost 25 years. And that was just as a consultant. Um, but I don't know what they would do for the language. Okay. Uh, they're going to, uh, for the library, they can make sure that they don't make changes to things in the way that change ABIs. Um, the Java folk, for example, have been really straightforward about that. Yeah, it didn't work. We're going to make a new version of it that fixes the problems. And instead of using, say, HashMap, you use HashMap 2 or HashMap new or whatever they call it, or improved HashMap or something like that. Um, I'm making fun of somebody's naming scheme. Don't worry about it. But hopefully you get a better name than new HashMap. Um, anyway. Um, Java has done a lot of that. They've done a lot of, oh yeah, this, this library facility is deprecated. Just don't use it anymore. Use this, which is really similar and much better. Um, I don't, I can't really speak about changing things at a language level because that's not my area of expertise. Um, let's see. Anchor asks, can optimization flags 01, 02, 03, um, result in ABI breakage. Um, oh, I sure hope not. Um, I don't believe that's a uh, that is um, something that should happen. I, I would consider that a bug, either a specification bug or a um, or a compiler bug, or maybe even a linker bug, because um, should not happen. You should be able to mix code at compiled at different optimization levels because you know sometimes you have to optimize the out of one inner loop and not the rest of stuff or you want to opt most of your code for size and um, much less of your code for you know one piece of your code for speed um, hopefully that answers your question all right Chris asks, an ABI break can cause a rejection of standard proposals, not always, but usually. But I noticed that standard optional change by in G++ between version 7.5 and 8.1 and Clang between version 7 and 8, uh, trivially copy a constructible for optional int went from no to yes. Um, why, would the, why would one change like this be accepted, but others not? Uh, I believe this is a timing thing. I believe that, that this change, optional, was made during the run-up for C++ 17. So while C++ 14 was the current standard, which did not contain optional, and C++ 17 not yet been adopted. And so at point, all, the, all the C++ 17 features were still quote unquote experimental. Um, GCC is very, very upfront in their uh, documentation. Let's see, plus plus a little less so, but um, that features that are in an upcoming but not yet adopted standard are not considered to be final, not considered to be stable, and so that's a case where there was a something was discovered to be not it, well. I don't know whether you could call it wrong or you could call it just not as good as it could be, but um, this was a case where you, the change was made to something which has not been released in a standard yet. And so there was much less resistance to changing that. And also because the idea of that 
people who were using optional before C++ 17 was re released were smaller, um, uh, were much smaller population. And these are people who are doing active development. And so recompiling their stuff is less of a burden for them. Okay. Um, Daniel asked, do you ever see a point where C++ could become a build you build your own ABI by picking and choosing which ABI breaking changes are brought? Um, we have that today, but in general, it's done by platform vendors. Um, people who distribute standard library dilibs, okay? Or people who link their standard libraries statically can do that today. But if you're going to use the, the standard library, dynamic library that is just part of your system, well, that pretty much defines the ABI for your system. So hopefully that um, hopefully that answers your question. If not, answer another one. Ask another one. I'm fine with that. Um, all right. Let's see. Boo, 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 boo. We did that one. Okay. What do you say about tools like libabigail or ABI Compat that can check ABI bring using dwarf information? Um, I am not that familiar with those. I tried playing with um, Lib Abigail a long, a long time ago, but lost interest fairly quickly because, well, my doesn't generate dwarf information. Um, you can certainly, uh, it could certainly do some of those things. But um, yeah, as you say, um, it, they're not going to be complete. And this is certainly not something you want end users to be doing. Uh, also, um, if I am a if I'm an end user and wondering if you know my my pins for well, I don't know, for my mail program are compatible with my ML program, I may not have dwarf information for those. Now, I believe that the Lib Abigail stuff is, in, and so on, ABI Compact is useful, but certainly not enough. Um, that is done. Are there any best practices, Andrew says, are there any best practices for using things like inline namespaces or symbol versioning to maintain AI compatibility? Um, So that was one of the goals for inline namespaces was that you could you know, have different, different versions of, um, of that were in different inline namespaces and they could be incompatible and the linker would, um, would pick those program loader would pick the right time, the linkers and the, and the program loaders. Uh, but I have never actually seen that successfully on a large project. And so I don't have any best project, best practice for that. LibC++ certainly puts all of its in STD colon colon underscore underscore one colon colon as a preparation for this. But every time I've gone and tried to make a w underscore underscore two and keep them side by side, I've gotten bogged down in an amazing set of details. So I don't really, um, don't have any good advice for you on this. Um, nice. Todd has just said, uh, has given a links to LibCuda that has, is doing this now. Good. Now I have some reading to do. Um, he's put it in, he has put the, a couple links in the Q&A for those. Um, John has asked, why is ABI a standards problem? 
it seems like it's the responsibility of the core creator. Uh, so the problem here is that there is no software creator. There is a collection of software creators. And um, they all have to work together to make software run successfully. There's the person who wrote the application. There's the person who provided the standard library dialib. There's the person who provided the other dialibs that the application need. There's people, who, the plugins. Um, anyway, lots of lots of different people. And to um, and say why is this a standards problem? Traditionally, it has not been a standards problem. It has been a well, not a stand. When I say standards problem, not a problem of the the ISO C++ standards committee. It has been it has been handled by the people who implement shared libraries, the people who maintain the um, ABI standards for individual platforms. It's technically it's not a standards problem. This is not something that the C++ standard addresses. But there are people on the C++ standard committee who are involved in addressing this. And now there are people on the C++ standards committee who um, wish to get into do this, get involved in this in more depth. So traditionally, it has been the people who ship standard library dialibs, okay, who say, yeah, no, we're not doing that because we'll break a bunch of existing software. That's what happened to the pair proposal for C++, I think it was 14, it was just like, yeah, no, we're, we're not doing this because you know it breaks existing code. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, see, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, J-U-S-S-I, um, so it asks, for unordered map, uh, could an alternative approach of defining a new hash map and leaving the old one, one untouched with guidelines recommended people to stop using it. Um, possible, yes. And that is very much the, uh, the, the way that both Java and Python have handled um, my, uh, what's a good way to put it, not my, updating their standard library, changing their standard library is defining facilities and recommending that people stop using the old one or deprecating the old one. Um, and moving on, I mean, essentially, right, the Python 3 people have started removing old stuff. Um, I don't believe, although my knowledge of this is somewhat dated, that the, that Java, the Java people have done that or they just left the old pieces in place. So um, yes, that is a very workable proposal. Um, whether or not um, people will be happy with it, I don't know. People are looking at alternate solutions as well. Uh, let's see. Victor has asked, are you a fan of the C++ epics proposal? Do I see something like Rust additions working for C++? Uh, I am not familiar enough with Rust additions to have a um, uh, an opinion on that. So I'm not <laughs> opine. Um, I am not a fan of C++ epics because I believe it will fracture the user base. Every time we fracture the user base, we leave a bunch of people behind and we, we make it harder for people to quote, quote, keep up, to continue to advance. I mean, this is happening now anyway. I mean, the example of um, C++, you know, the, the, the Libstead C++ string, string uh, layout was an example of the string functionality. And we have this now with C++03, C++11, 14, 17, 20, and whatever comes after 20. We have this now, but we're trying to keep the um, the cost of moving as small as possible. You know, in an ideal world, we would like to have everybody using the latest and greatest stuff. But we don't, but to make it so that people can, it's easy for people to move upward. If you prefer, if you want to say that, if you if you want to 
give a value judgment towards the, the more current stuff on their own schedule. And I think that that C++ Epics will, if, in, if enacted, would encourage people not to. Um, that's just my opinion. That's not, you know, it's based on me sitting and listening to a 45 minute presentation of C++ Epics. So I have not done a lot of, um, a lot of investigation. All right, let's see, do we have any other ones? I think that's the end of the questions.